Hello, everyone. You're very, very welcome to today's webinar. This is a um, graduate and professional studies webinar on preparing for conferences as a PhD candidate. Now, I did a version of this webinar back in, I think it was almost uh, six months ago. I think it was back in April when I did it. And I thought it might be a good time either to revisit it because of the proliferation of online conferences and also because I'm aware that so many of you are um, new students who wouldn't have been able to avail of that webinar back then. And indeed, many of you who are current students also wouldn't have been able to uh, take part in that particular webinar back in uh, April. Could I just ask you all before we begin, just if you could just mute your microphones before we begin. Um, I've realized that can be an impediment to um, interacting with each other, but um, it's just to pre prevent any um, distraction to everybody else. So thanks for that. So I think we can begin uh, with this um, webinar. As I say, because of the proliferation of online conferences, I suppose this has um, a lot of relevance for you, uh, just in terms of, say, how you can present your research, communicate your research to a much wider audience and become uh, well known within your field, as well as, you know, networking with your peers and with colleagues and meeting um, experts and world renowned experts in your area. There are, if you like, barriers and obstacles to that, which are difficult to overcome, but I hope to provide some kind of uh, guidance on how it, there may be a way to kind of to circumvent or to get around some of those particular problems. There are certain advantages as well with online conferences, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, but for the most part, it's about uh, providing some assistance, if you like, to you as a PhD candidate in how you can uh, disseminate your research to um, a wider audience. So uh, let's begin. So an academic conference, you know, what makes it different from a, a from any other type of conference? It usually is a, a one day or a multi day event um, during which researchers such as yourselves prevent, present, not prevent, present your work to each other. Um, and uh, in, in uh, this, the scenarios differ, obviously, for, you know, for, for um, there are, um, if you like, some conferences which can last for, um, for up to a week effectively. Um, which I think is what I think the International Educational Studies Association conference um, held every around Easter time every year, which tends uh, in the United States, which um, tends to have thousands of papers and thousands of presenters and takes place, as I say, over a week. So it's a marathon type of um, type of event. But that would be a, a quite an exception to the to the norm. Normally it's a, it's a one day, two day, three day maximum. Uh, tends to be the case with regard to an international conference. So it can be international, national, regional, local, and obviously some conferences are dev are devoted or dedicated to different subfields within a particular discipline. Um, you can also have, if you like, interdisciplinary conferences. Um, uh, but again, I'm going to give you some advice perhaps on why some interdiscipline, some interdisciplinary conferences um, should be approached with caution. Some of those I'll, I'll explain later. Um, and what you usually have is obviously, like any conference, you have keynote or plenary speakers where you have um, those who speak to the whole of the presidium or the whole of the conference um, gathered together, usually in, in one room. Of course, everything has changed because of COVID-19, and I'll talk about that in, in, in a little while. So why would you present at conferences as a, as a PhD candidate? What is it, what benefit is there to you um, in, in presenting your research at a, at, at a conference, or why not? You know, why go to that um, trouble and bother and time and effort and expense involved of presenting at conferences? But there are very good reasons to do so. Um, first of all, it allows you to showcase your ideas. 
and and importantly also to hear new ones and if you like it provides an, uh, opportunities for networking and meeting your peers which i'll talk about it um provides you with an opportunity to get feedback and practical advice and feedback that you would not ordinarily get and it allows people to see your research with um with new eyes and new ears and that can be really useful getting that kind of feedback which you uh, wouldn't get from from um from close colleagues or from even perhaps not even from your supervisor. So that can be very, very useful. Also, it helps you just in terms of enhancing your own reputation as a scholar. Um, impact is something which I've referenced quite a lot in these webinars and conferences are a good way of um, uh, showing that your research has got, a, you know, an impact beyond your own um, uh, beyond your own university. Um, it's also good practice um, because it can be quite an intimidating arena, particularly a first conference. It can be, you know, it, um, you can find some people who are very, very nervous and very intimidated and very skeptical about appearing before a big audience uh, and presenting, you know, before peers and before experts. And it can really be, um, um, at quite a, an intimidating arena for you know, just the thought of it. Usually conferences, uh, though people who attend conferences do understand if somebody is an early stage researcher and that, um, you know, that the, um, that they are at a particular level or stage in the research. Um, and so they do tend to be quite, uh, quite understanding of that. But it's good practice for you, for your thesis and for your, for your Viva also, because yeah, they, it can be, as I say, an intimidating arena, but it can help you to hone a lot of the skills and to refine those skills, um, particularly with regard to communicating your research. Um, it's a good, it's, it, it's a good forum to do so. Sometimes it's a requirement of, of your funders. Uh, your funding body that you do present your research that you disseminate your research as widely as possible and as i said it can provide motivation and stimulus to your phd because you, usually what would happen in a what we might call a traditional conference is that you can get a lot of feedback a lot of great ideas um about your um, presentation which you can then bring into and feed into your uh, into your own research um, obviously, it's a great way to meet your peers and experts in your field, or it was at least prior to the pandemic. Um, it obviously provides an opportunity also for collaboration and for publication, um, which can happen um, uh, at a conference. It allows also for um, cross-cultural interaction with other scholars, particularly if you're traveling to an international conference, and that can be invaluable also. You can learn, you can pick up ideas and tips just with regard to practices, to methods, to resources, all very useful. And as I say, it can be a really good way of overcoming your fears and your skepticism about presenting um, to a large audience. And it can help you also to somehow deal with uh, imposter syndrome because it's amazing presenting at conferences, if you get positive feedback, how how much confidence that can fill you with uh, and how uh, it can provide a, a great catalyst for you to continue your research. So where to start, traditionally anyway, and here I'm talking about, you know, a, you're preparing to go to um, a, a, a typical conference. What I mean by a typical conference is one where, which you attend w uh, in person and face to face with um, usually with m many, many others. So do your research and ask questions in advance. Um, I would say it's a good idea, maybe, you know, not to go for, not always to go for the, the highest conference at the start. Something to discuss, obviously, with your mentor, or your supervisor. It can be it can help just to start off in a, a modest conference and even to present a seminar or a workshop among your own peers and your own colleagues um, within your own faculty and to gradually build up and to to to, to reach for a, a higher, if you like, um, and, and more widespread audience. Um, it's good also to establish a timeline to prepare for conferences um, because they do take quite a bit of preparation. Um, I would say just in terms of, say, if, if I were to give an overview of what 
um, advice I'd give to somebody if they were looking to attend a conference, I would say, first of all, identify the conference. And again, you know, if, if it's one um, which in which, say, uh, the uh, your chances of being accepted for um, for presentation at the conference are somewhat low, I would say perhaps it's better to try an, another type of conference. But given the proliferation of online conferences these days, many more papers are accepted than was the case heretofore. So it's also the case that your chances of getting accepted, even you know, in, in these highly prestigious world-renowned conferences, indeed have been enhanced uh, by the pandemic. So it's one of those, if you like, um, unintended benefits uh, that have arisen because of the, the, the current situation. Um, also, just apply for a presentation, plan your attendance. This is what one would traditionally do in terms of your budget and your travel, and you'd apply to your department or your faculty or school or unit for support and funding. You would prepare your paper or your, your poster. I'll talk about the differences between both and the different styles that they that that, that um, both of these um, particular formats require. And obviously attend the conference and then you submit your claim to get your expenses reimbursed. That is what one would traditionally do when it comes to a um, conference. And for example, you know, there's a conference advertised at Conference on Modern Research in Education, Teaching and Learning in Paris in November this year, which has had to be cancelled. But it's now becoming an online conference. So again, other opportunities there um, for, for presenters, but a different type of challenge particularly for those people who are going to be presenting their research. So just in terms of what I call traditional conferences, because maybe if you're looking at these slides in a year or so, and hopefully so much of what we're encountering at the moment in terms of COVID-19 pandemic will be less acute and will be will have less of an impact on our daily lives. Maybe you're looking at these slides then and you could say, well, um, how do I now go about going to a a face to face or what one might call a traditional conference. So I would say that it's a good idea to read the conference program in advance of the conference and make a plan before you go. A lot of people don't do this and it can somewhat. Um, uh, it, but I think it's a really good idea to do so because you can arrive at a conference, not have a plan of what you're going to do, and you could find that there's a um, there's a paper that you want to get to but it clashes with another paper. Or maybe it's the case that you have planned to meet somebody for dinner uh, at a certain time and there's a paper on or uh, that, that you would really like to go. So it's good to take the program in advance of when you go, look at who is speaking and then decide which papers you're going to, uh, going to attend or intend to attend at the very least. Okay, um, I would say um, it's always a good idea to attend the plenary sessions of the, I'll just ask um, um, people maybe just to turn off their microphones if that's okay, sorry, thank you. I'll just ask people to, um, sorry, I'll just uh, say that it's always a good idea to attend the plenary sessions um, of the uh, keynote speakers um, because you'll always find something that they say that will be, of, that will be useful, uh, almost invariably. So it's always a good idea uh, to do so. And also it just provides another opportunity to network and to meet your peers and colleagues. And obviously, you know, it's important also always to talk to people at conferences, attend these so-called networking sessions. Personally, I, I I hate them, you know, where it's a case of you're, you're given um, uh, what's called a, a networking, um, a, a networking event. And it's almost a, a fabricated or artificial chance to meet. But but some people do like them and avail of them. But personally, I I it's just my nature. I just find that form of interaction quite convoluted and quite artificial. Uh, so I just prefer to go to conferences and to um, perhaps meet some of the speakers afterwards. But again, I know people who love networking sessions and think they're invaluable. Um, I, I I just find them just um, hard, hard going, I would say, uh, but that's just my nature. But then there are things like drink receptions, poster sessions, um, you know, the conference dinner, all of which are, you know, tend to be um, good opportunities for you to talk to people 
uh, and, and to find out more about their research and to tell them about what you're doing also. The new reality that we're dealing with, of course, is online conferences. And I'll just talk about these for a little while um, because this is what I think we'll probably have to deal with for, oh, it looks like at least a, could be another year that we have, you know, of just of, of online conferences uh, where online conferences are, are, are the norm um and and uh, are um the, the new reality that we have to confront but um it looks even if you know even if there is you know even if we if we come through this pandemic and there is a vaccine and people are inoculated and and then it's deemed safe to travel again around the world even at that it's quite likely because of our experience um, with online conferences and with online communication throughout the pandemic, it's quite likely that quite a number of conferences will remain online or will, will have a format where they are a hybrid conference, where they have part face-to-face -face and, and part online. And there are, if you like, good reasons for that, um, partly because I guess technology has facilitated online conferences in a way that would not have been possible, say, four or five um, years ago. Um, they, as I said, they're likely to continue. One reason why online conferences have become somewhat popular or somewhat um, at least more prevalent and regular is because they are deemed to be more accessible for people. And um, because now, you know, I know some of you are watching this uh, in in, I know many of you are in Algeria, for example, which is great, which is wonderful. Um, but it's a new reality. It's a new form of um, of communication for so for so many of us. Um, if this were a a webinar, a face to face webinar, obviously there would be so many people who would be unable to attend, and um, there would be all kinds of. Uh, of difficulties in doing so. So technology has made things in some way more accessible um, to us. It's far from ideal, of course, you know, online communication and um, uh, online classes and online webinars, not always uh, ideal, but it does make your access um, to, to things like this, um, it, it makes it easier. And uh, it certainly would, um, be far as a, it, it's it facilitates you to, to come and attend rather than in a face in a face to face format, which might be difficult for for whatever reason. Um, in it in a in a typical if you like non COVID nineteen scenario. Uh, another reason why online conferences have become more popular is because they are much more affordable. Now, um, for many people, going to conferences was a huge was very was um, a huge deterrent because of the cost. Because some conferences, for example, I know, for example, I always like to attend the uh, UK conference on um, a, um, UK CGE. So it's always the um, conference on graduate education. But some of the costs involved are extortionate. And particularly when it, the case was when there was a currency difference, a huge currency differential between the euro and sterling, for example, attending conferences in the UK, in the United Kingdom was was very, very expensive and uh, and and really unaffordable for many, many people. But online conferences have become much more uh, much more affordable and more accessible. As I say, they tend to take on more papers and and they tend to provide for a wider audience than, than was previously the case. But it also entails what one might call embracing the awkward because we deal with things like um, different time zones with um, problems with communication, with difficulties with broadband and bandwidth and, um, and, and things like um, breakout rooms and controlling the technology and sometimes this can be very very difficult to do for a for a conference situation here it's we're dealing with a much simpler situation than at a conference because it's just me talking if you like with a um you know and it's a monologue but and obviously you know your microphones are muted and your videos are turned off but in a conference situation it's quite likely that we would have you know an open discussion after each paper 
and just controlling that kind of technology and making sure it, that the conference sessions run on time is is much more difficult. So, but again, embracing the awkward means, you know, for many people and for many of you who are doing a, a conference presentation, it 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 would probably feel somewhat strange to do as I'm doing now and to talk into your, you know, into 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 the screen, what looks like you're talking into the screen of a laptop with your um, um, with, with a microphone attached to your head. So it's it's um, somewhat uh, a, an, an ominous and an, uh, anomalous situation, uh, an awkward situation for, for many people and just coping with that technology uh, and making sure that the conference runs smoothly and that there are no technical hitches or breakdowns can be a, a really, really challenging task for so many. So people are getting used to that about online conferences and using things like, you know, teams or live events, uh, which can be, you know, which are great, but they do have certain um, uh, ha have certain challenges, which um, can make them somewhat um, somewhat awkward to use for, for so this would be for example this is just a screenshot i took of um of, of of a conference that took place over the summer and again this is if you like a, this is a glimpse of the new reality that we are dealing with and of course there are you know lots of advantages to that and that people don't have to travel you know so the environmental impact is reduced there are also advantages just in terms of let's say you don't have to look for a hotel or you don't have to pay for you know your expenses and you're not away from your family for so long while you're um, attending a conference etc cetera, etc cetera. so there are certain advantages to doing so but there are of course obviously um a great deal of drawbacks as well because that intimacy and that kind of um if you like the building up of friendships and you know use use of um things like gestures and body language and um they all of those things have become things of the past under this new reality. So um, what do online conferences do? I suppose they permit obviously a greater number of participants. And uh, it also another um, facet of online conferences is that they improve the chances of, of attracting high quality presenters. Um, I'm going to show you something about predatory conferences just in a short time, but there's also a link to that, which is by um, an organization which organizes some fantastic virtual conferences and online conferences. And they provide opportunities, for example, now to hear, there's one I'll show you, which provides an opportunity to hear, you know, a Nobel Prize winner for free and to hear some fantastic stellar speakers. So we have now an opportunity to engage with some of the leading experts in their field in the world um, in a way which may not have been possible before and at a very, you know, or sometimes a negligible um, amount of money. And also, you know, it, it allows us to do so from our own homes. So there are certain advantages to that. But again, you know, and then there are the drawbacks of which you are all very, very much aware. So I would say just if you're preparing, if you are thinking and if you are invited and if you have been accepted to give a paper at an online conference um i would say first of all beware of the time zones of the conference host so think of you know what is the um you know if, if it's on what might be called pdt or pacific district time think of that you know so if the conference is in california it's going to be you know eight hours behind um irish time or if you're based in algeria it's going to be nine hours behind i think yeah and so you have to think then so if, if you get accepted for a conference the conference is you know organized by a group in california it could mean that you have then you know just make sure that you're not you have not been booked in to present you may be given a slot which says you know um 12 p.m you know this around this time and you think oh that's fantastic you know it gives me lots of time to get up and to get prepared and to uh you know and to, to get ready and to relax into the day and perfect but then you look at it and it's pacific district time and you realize it's 4 a.m that the conference is going to, that you were expected to present so 
be aware of that. So if you are attending or if you're presenting at a conference, an online conference, beware of the time zone. And if you have, if you are faced with a situation like that, you know, where you are, um, where you have been slotted to present at 4 a.m. in the morning, be aware, you know, or just be aware of that in advance that that could happen and ask the, and make a request to the conference organizers that you are and going to present at a civilized time of the day. Obviously, you know, all of these things are very self-explanatory. Test your connection in advance. Um, it, it may be an idea if you're worried about bandwidth to pre-record your presentation only so that, for example, if there is an issue um, that you would be able to say, well, I have, I can send you a recording of the presentation. You may be able to send a link with that. It may be on YouTube, whatever. You could send it then to the conference. Um, uh, and then answer questions about that presentation afterwards. And obviously there are huge challenges around presenting and networking, which I think are very obvious to you all. Um, the, the, the quality of, our, and th this is, you know, again, um, online conferences might become even, you know, an area of study as so many aspects of um, how we communicate and how we um, disseminate research in the pandemic, how, how all of those kind of things and how we teach during the pandemic, all of those things are going to be the subject of uh, a great deal of scrutiny and study, uh, obviously. But I would say that it, from what I've seen so far, the better online conferences will attempt, they will, I, and I have seen instances of it where they do try and replicate the conference experience um, to the utmost. Um, I attended a conference over the summer in which we were all um, we were given um, a, a task beforehand that we had to do. And then we had to go into what were called breakout rooms and we were all mandated to go to these breakout rooms. So we had about eight people in each group and we all met um, online. So there was maybe there could have been 400 people at this conference, but we were broken into groups of eight, which again, that's like 50 groups of eight people which is no easy task for the conference organizers. And we were sent a link beforehand to the breakout rooms and breakout sessions. And in those breakout sessions, we had really good discussions. So um, so the, that was an example of one of the better online conferences. Again, that took a lot of organization, a great deal of work by the organizers, but they did manage to bring people into um, a more if you like intimate and a more friendly um, scenario. So, and, and it was really good as a, as an attendee as well, because you didn't feel as isolated or as, you know, as detached from the conference as you would, you know, when, when there are 400 other people online. Um, and the breakout groups were created in advance, which was a really great idea. And it's also important to remember, you know, that when you are, doing a presentation at a conference that people are they're interested in your research for the most part rather than your presentation it's really good to have a good presentation it, you know it's, it's really important to have a good presentation but you know it's mostly that people your research that people will be there to hear about and um, so try to present that in a way that's as, as, as accessible and that is as um uh as um uh I would say as um, expertly as possible. Okay, so if you are, say for example, if you are organizing an online conference, and I'm aware that some of you, that you will be tasked with organizing um, an, an, an online conference at some stage. These are just things which I would give as pieces of advice. They're pieces of advice for you organizing, but also pieces of advice for, if you're attending an online conference also. So think of the format that uh, the conference is going to be, you know, when it's going to start, when it's going to end. Take into account the fact that, you know, you may have an international audience and that you will have people, as I say, in different time zones and make it amenable to people from different time zones as well. I've seen lots of um, online events now and lots of seminars and workshops and indeed online conferences which start which tend to start at around um 12 um uh, 12 p.m or sometimes they might start even even later in the day um there was one which i attended recently the vitae conference in the uk and um, this is an organization dedicated to graduate education 
And again, every session started in the afternoon. So we had basically sessions which started at 2 p.m. and went until 6 p.m. That was to facilitate people um, if they wanted to attend, say, for example, in um, people on the east coast of the of of the of, of the USA uh, and 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 people in Central Europe, people in Africa who were then able to attend this conference. And that was a good example of a conference which normally would be very, very expensive to attend, but which had a relatively minor registration charge. And that made a big difference in terms of accessibility uh, and in terms of the number of attendees who were able to access the conference. So think about how many time zones you have to span, how many parallel sessions and breakouts. Again, as I said, I mentioned that conference I attended in the summer, really great just having those breakout sessions um, because it allowed just for much more productive um, insight into others' research uh, and allowed one to, to talk about one's own, one's own work. So think about how many participants there are going to be. Um, you have to then ask, well, are these going to be interactive sessions or keynote speeches or monologues? And so that, again, is another big consideration. Um, will it be invited speakers only or will it be an open call for contributions as you'd normally have with a conference? Um, you have to decide, you know, will it be plenary sessions or will it be parallel sessions in breakout rooms or both? And that conference I attended in the summer and that had those breakout rooms. It also had plenary sessions, really, really good plenary sessions as well. And then you have to decide, you know, if you're going to use some pre-recorded presentations just in case people do have a problem. And I would say, you know, if you are organizing a conference, it's always a good idea to tell those who are presenting to have a pre-recording of their presentation just in case something goes wrong um, with the technology and something invariably does go wrong with the technology. OK, so I mentioned something earlier called predatory conferences, and uh, these are, if you like, you might be able to guess from the term predatory, and I, I've talked before about predatory publishing, but predatory conferences are, are ones which obviously are not um, legitimate, they are not um, credible, they attract or are intended to attract you solely for your, your solely for your, your your money. They only have a profit based motive. Um, they have no uh, credibility in terms of um, publication because as and, and in terms of submission or acceptance to the conference because they will accept everyone who who applies. They will then claim that they will have. Um, a publication emanating from this, and often they do, but it is invariably in a predatory journal also, which will then extort more money from you. So you, uh, but because of um, obviously the nature of communications and technology, predatory conferences now are much more common than what they were, and they do sucker and bring in a lot of people who are, you know, sometimes brilliant academics get um, tricked into attending these predatory conferences. And again, because of the uh, the extent to which now so many conferences are online, more and more of these, I would call them charlatans and um, deceptive operators are trying to entice people to attend. So these are conferences which are not organized by scholarly or professional societies. And I won't dwell too long on them, but I think I think it's good for you to know that there are these types of conferences out there that will try and um, uh, and 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 uh, and entice you to attend. But um, I'll just give you some advice of how to uh, avoid those. Um, typically run by companies and private operators who exploit unknowing uh, researchers. So PhD and early stage researchers are a real, if you like, target market for these because sometimes you can be, you can find an email in your inbox, which is, you know, which is inviting contributions for a conference and you think great and you could submit something and you would be accepted you think wonderful you go to the conference and find that it is it is something of a farce um and but even at that you they would still offer 
to publish your paper in a, in a journal. And obviously, as I say, that would be in a predatory journal. But I think it's just important, you know, for you to know what they are like so that you can avoid falling into their trap. They are not never uh, highly regarded and will do nothing for your credibility as a researcher. Um, it's, it's, it's as well to ask yourself some questions before you look and uh, before you decide to sign up for one of these conferences, find out if the who is organizing it. If it's, you know, if, if it's not a university or a research institute or a governmental organization or a credible body with a long track record, just beware. Beware that this could be a predatory conference. And um, think about what the peer review process for submissions is and the acceptance rate for submissions, because normally what they do is that, you know, you submit something, it could be absolute garbage. Um, and some people have, have tried that. They've just sent in, they have done, they have tested whether it's a predatory conference by sending in something which is absolute rubbish just to, to detect whether or not the conference being organized is a predatory conference and what they have found invariably those people who have submitted these trick applications or these rubbish applications why they have done that is because they can then detect whether it is a predatory conference a predatory conference or an a real or genuine academic conference so if you submit something for a conference and it's accepted almost immediately, then beware. Um, it doesn't mean that your paper is not wonderful. What it means is that it's likely that the organizers have um, have uh, motives which are which are far from um, uh, far from scrupulous. The, I've put a link in here, just a list to some of the better known um, predatory conferences. But again, they are they are increasing all the time. But I'll give you some ideas just in a moment for how to avoid predatory conferences as well. Just look also at you know the options to contact the conference organizers and check their bona fides and their email address also. Um, the email address tends to be a bit of a giveaway, and I'll just show you something about this in a moment. Uh, look for the timeline of paper acceptance. You know, as I say, if you're accepted, you know, within hours of submitting, um, that would be very, very uh, unusual. And that would mean that there was no peer review process with regard to uh, paper submission and acceptance. And they are likely to be, if you like, single one off events rather than an annual occurrence. They tend to have no tradition or no um uh or, or no um a reiteration or repetition behind them they tend to be these one-off events which are purely profit motive which are purely based on, on on profit of course lots of genuine and brilliant conferences are are also sometimes organized by people with a strong profit motive but but they tend to be you know as i say uh, credible and well-established organizations um and just see if the, the the there is invariably the promise of publication also that by attending this conference your um your paper could be um published in a, in a journal afterwards and that could be very tempting for a lot of people it can bring in a lot of young researchers in particular who think wonderful look at this i'm going to this international conference my paper's been accepted straight away and not only that but when when i speak after i speak at the conference after I come home, there then will be the opportunity to have uh, a, a an international publication in this journal, and people think fantastic. But of course, this is where you really need to have your antennae really attuned to the fact that um, there are these charlatans operating in the field. So look for the publication and see: is it indexed? Is it a credible publication? Is it one that um, is already um you know in the in in the ul library for example is it one with a reputation so you need to be very very careful about that so just see if it's indexed in indexed in any of the major um databases in in your field and that would be a telltale sign also and um, there's a link there that's um enago this is um an organization which does 
which organizes really, really excellent conferences. But this gives tips on how to identify um, and how to avoid predatory conferences. And if you go into that link, you can also sign up for a, a, a really, really good, a proper um, international conference for free. It's an online um, conference. Uh, you can find a link to that there, but I'll, I'll say no more about that for now. But just this is an example. This is an email the example um, which um, which I received some t last year. When was it? March of last year. And it had all the signs, uh, you know, when it comes in, came into my inbox and I thought, OK, that looks really good. It's um, ICRA or whoever. So it's, that's an international conference on recent advancements in interdisciplinary research. And oh, that's that sounds interesting. So it said, you know, it was a an invitation for paper submission. And uh, it said that selected papers would be published. And there were all these different uh, streams or all these different areas covered in the conference program. And I thought, oh, wow, that looks uh, that looks quite interesting. However, I began to investigate a little bit further. And this is what I found. I found, first of all, that the email address with the um, with the conference, if you can see it there, it's Sanjay Kumar at 01655 at gmail.com. So the email address was a giveaway, if you like, um, that it was not affiliated with any professional organization. So again, that got me thinking, hmm, Perhaps this isn't what I think it is. Um, so you have to be aware, wary and to be aware that there will be people who have these, you know, these these bad motives who will try, you know, and, and sucker you in. So immediately I thought mm, that looks somewhat that looks um, a little bit suspect. And then you look and see, OK, the promise, you know, there's a promise of publication again. Um, that can be a sign. It can can be not always, obviously, but it can be a sign that perhaps the motives of those um, organizing this conference are somewhat ulterior. And then you can see that every discipline is represented. Uh, again, something of a telltale sign where every single discipline, virtually every single discipline, is being um, uh, is is being um, subject is being represented at a conference. So that looks really, really suspicious. So I began to investigate for, you know, even further than that and found out, yes, I, I so I, I was able to look at the, the database of predatory conferences and to find out indeed that this so-called international conference on recent advancements in, in interdisciplinary research was indeed a predatory conference. So that's, you know, a real reason why, you know, you need to be careful because this looked at first like a credible email um, with, you know, as I said, the promise of publication afterwards, but it's something that you really, really need to be attuned to that people will try and bring you in. And it's a really terrible waste of your own effort and your expertise and your time that people like this um, um, are out there trying to bring, you know, particularly early stage researchers such as yourselves uh, into this arena um, because it 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 just it's it's a futile exercise for you in terms of your academic um, uh, and uh, professional growth and development and it's just a really really important um, thing to look out for predatory conferences and predatory publishers. Okay, so just to talk about just the, the types of. Um, conference presentation and I'm, I'm very aware of course that for you you know you're you're listening to this you know um for a long period of time and that can be quite trying and there's a um and just without the lack of if you like of interactivity it can be quite difficult so if you have any questions just please put them into the um uh, if you think of anything you know even while i'm speaking please put them into the conversation box and we can then have um a discussion uh, afterwards in a short time. I'll go through this quite quickly because I think a lot of this is self-explanatory. So obviously, you know, there are two types of conference presentation. There's oral and there's a the, the poster. So what we think of as a conference presentation is usually, you know, your, your, your paper dealing with your research. Usually it's about uh, 15 to 20 minutes long. 
And there are other things also like a three minute thesis competition, which I'll, I'll talk about or a thesis in three, which I'll talk about. And obviously I'll talk about a poster later, but just in terms of an oral presentation, these are just some tips I would give you uh, just to avoid making some of these particular mistakes. Uh, know your audience. So think of what is the audience? Is it members of the public? Is it experts in your field? Is it a conference that's dedicated you know, to your discipline? And will it be people there who are predominantly aware of the kinds of research you're doing? Or is it a more general conference? Um, and if it's a more general conference, you may need to um, refine your um, your presentation so that it is a case of disseminating your research to a non-expert audience. Uh, and again, just remember that you don't have to tell people everything you know or everything you've done. It's a short presentation and just try and communicate it as best you can and keep it succinct and concise and make sure that it's relevant um, to the audience also. I stick with the allotted time, leave time for questions and answers. That's a bit rich coming from me, given how um, sometimes I always go over my own allotted time and and uh, but I'll try to, you know, but it's always a good idea at a conference to leave time for for a question and answer session. Give an overview at the start, obviously, and conclusions at the end. I think a lot of this will be self explanatory, self explanatory to so many of you anyway. Preparation obviously is the key. And what I always try to do before a conference is to do a couple of run throughs of the presentation itself, just to make sure that I'm not going well over the time. Um, again, not everybody does this, but I just think that um, it's 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 just a, a good practice. And um, I would check also the conference that, 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 you know, particularly when it's a face to face conference, so important to check out the technology that's going to be used because sometimes people find they've pre prepared something on a Mac, they bring a USB and it doesn't quite, it's not compatible with the technology that's there. So that's something, you know, so it's always a good idea to send the presentation to your um, email address in advance so that you have it in another format rather than on a USB, uh, solely on a USB. It's important to have it in USB, but just make sure that you, you know, um, that it's not, it's going to be compatible with the technology being used. Obviously, all, everything to do with the grammar and spell check, really important. And try and tell a good story, you know, to talk about your research. What is it? Why does it matter? What are the key messages to it? And talk to as well. Just make sure that the audience can feel somewhat involved, even though if, it, if it's a bit like this where, you know, I'm communicating to so many of you, but I, I hope you do feel involved in what we're uh, doing here. But it's just the case that, you know, even when your audience don't have a chance to speak until the end of the presentation, it's it's important that they do feel a part of it. Uh, and so you're not just talking, you know, you're not just looking down, reading a paper and not looking at the audience at any stage. You have to communicate to make eye contact with the audience, as awkward as that is for, 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 for quite a number of people. I would say, or what to avoid. These are just some examples of what to avoid in oral presentations. This is one where it, this, I'm just going to give you a demonstration of what not to do when creating and using PowerPoint slideshows. Um, so, one instance could be where you have too much text or the font is too small. So I would say avoid large blocks of text and presentation. Again, a lot of this should be obvious to you. Emphasize what your main points are. Um, I would say six by six, just six bullet points, six words per bullet point is a really good idea for each slide. One main idea, six bullet points at most and six words per each bullet point. Use pictures, you know, that PowerPoint obviously is multimedia and use a large font. So this is an example of what, uh, this is horrible. This is just awful. So you see there, lots of text compressed together. E impossible, really, really impossible for the audience to look at. And I don't know how anybody could present something like this in such a format. Really, really desperate. You know, it's much more like a form of academic karaoke where the presenter is just, um, looking at what's on the screen and repeating that um it's just there's no interaction no sense of any kind of spontaneity or any kind of um uh, uh, any any kind of deviation from what's on the screen whatsoever 
and and that can make it really really tedious for the audience too much slide animation you know this this is a prob this can be a problem just keep the slide simple uh, i would say that busy slides divert attention from the content i'm just going to show you an example of one of those busy slides and what to avoid i would say use one slide transition style and um, what do i normally use is it is it normally fade can't remember what it is in terms of animations or appear. I think it's called uh, in the animation scheme. Bad color choices, obviously, you know, loud, horrible, garish colors, just really, really, really um, bad. And avoid colors that fade into the background, like blue and black. Uh, and avoid colorblind combinations like red and green and blue and yellow. And um, that can be actually um, something which you may not consider but which is a good thing to, to take into account before presenting. This again, horrible uh, slide here, um, impossible to read, but it's a, it's sometimes amazing the kind of things you see at, 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 at conferences and the way people present sometimes you realize, oh my God, like what kind of thought process has gone into this? Sometimes you just get uh, over, you can get just get overwhelmed. I would say keep pictures or use them in moderation and keep the slides simple. One or two pictures per slide is usually enough. Um, and uh, for, for many uh, reasons, I'm going to show you an example here of what not to do when it comes to um, a presentation, uh, because it can just look, this is just, this is horrible. I just think, you know, if you ended up in a situation like this where you had all this kind of animation and you had, you know, so many pictures, maybe 10, 11, 12 pictures per slide. Just um, just really, really just so much distraction and diversion from the message itself. And that's just this is an example, I think, of the worst kind of presentation you can give where it's garish, where it's just overwhelming, where you're distracting from the message. And um, so this type, type of presentation is one to be avoided at all costs. Um, just think of what could go wrong. Something may go wrong. It can go wrong. Just have a backup of your presentation. As I say, something to avoid is, you know, or something to be aware of is if you're, you know, um, presenting on a Mac or if you're doing your, your presentation on a Mac, is it compatible with the technology to be used? Um, always, I would say, Always have printouts of what it is you intend to do just in case something can go wrong because you can then find that you are left in a situation where you don't have the 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 PowerPoint. I sometimes found I was at a conference once where the technology didn't work, but actually I found it to be one of the most enjoyable conferences because uh, conference presentations I did because actually what it meant was that I just spoke um I may have had a couple of notes. But I just I just spoke about the research, you know, about about the research. And I found it was actually more enjoyable to do it that way. Um, be, and I was able to cover more ground uh, rather than a, um, you know, a very, um, a f uh, if you like, functional or a very um, uh, structured uh, PowerPoint presentation. But again, it's not for everybody and people sometimes do panic if the technology doesn't work. So you don't need to apologize all the time if something does go wrong. People understand that these things do happen. Um, I, another way, a really good way of communicating your research, and this can happen at conferences, is that there may be a three minute thesis competition. And uh, what that could be is that you may have just, you may appear, you may have one slide or you may have zero slides uh to yeah and you talk about your research and again it's all about dissemination and communication to usually to a non-expert audience and it's a good way to celebrate your research and it can really help you just in terms of communication skills and just in disseminating your research to the wider public i put in here an example which you'll be able to see later this is um uluwashina Akinsanmi, who did a brilliant presentation. I think this is fantastic. It's called Antibiotic Resistance Crisis, the Sawdust Redemption. Really, really excellent. And it's well worth looking at that presentation. And he does it so well. It's a three minute thesis competition. And he won one of the categories um, at the Vitae uh, UK conference in uh, 2019. 
uh, again, just a really good way of how someone can communicate research in an excellent fashion uh, in in three minutes. And it's a really, really, um, I, I, and really, really uh, insightful topic as well. And one that is so timely and one that is, you know, so, so, so uh, crucial um, to our survival as a species. So um, I just thought brilliant uh, presentation, excellent topic. Uh, fantastic communication skills and really good way of um, connecting with the audience also. So you can watch that afterwards um, after I, I, I post these slides. I said, obviously, there's also a poster, you know, so you, at a conference, you have a oral presentation. There's also a poster, um, poster presentation, just in terms of your, if you are designing a poster for a conference, just check the requirements of the organizers just in terms of the you know the size of the poster you don't want to go in with one that's a gargantuan size when the requirements of the conference may be that you know you have a rel relatively um um a typical be it you know a3 size uh poster and um, powerpoint is the most common tool obviously for poster design and you can find an awful lot of tips online um about that and th again it could be the case that you're asked to make a presentation you st sometimes what can happen is that at lunchtime in a conference session that you're asked to stand by your poster and talk about it for three four five minutes and then people ask questions so it tends to be less formal than an oral presentation but in terms of online conferences you can also see online poster submissions where people do present their post their the research in a poster format and talk about it for a sh for a short amount of time. This is just a good example. This is from somebody called um, Dr. Tullio Rossi um, about how to design uh, a, a really really good poster. And I love the way this is this is laid out um, because it, it just uh, gives you the essence of what a poster should have. And you can look at that later. Um, I think it just gives excellent tips just on how to present your data, how to design um, uh, a, um, a, a really, really excellent poster and how to get the main message across um, uh, just in terms of, say, the background, the methods that you used, um, what your findings were, what conclusions you came to. Really, really, I think this is just, you know, excellent way, excellent idea for how to um, get um, or make a really, really good um, conference poster presentation. And uh, we have some uh, resources. Again, I'm just giving you a few resources here that you could use, but there are so, so many online that you can use. These are just about conference present pro conference. These are just tips on conference presentation and things like, you know, how to avoid predatory conferences and how to avoid getting suckered into um, uh, attending and paying for and uh, being affiliated with a predatory conference. So for now, I think that's all for now. And um, what I'll do is I'll just stop the recording and then what we'll have is hopefully you'll have some questions or some comments or some observations or any kind of queries that you may have. Uh, and um, so I look forward to hearing those and to seeing what it is that you um, um, have um, taken perhaps from the presentation, but also just th things or experiences that you'd like to share as well. So I'm looking forward to that. So I'll just stop the recording now and um, talk to you shortly. <laughs>